Now I've taken that first picture out of Africa. Uh, Sydney may recognize this. I also want to paraphrase this as in science there are many ways to the top. You can take different routes up to Kilimanjaro and then often you think you have reached the summit and then you have a new view how science works. But often you have, it's cloudy and then the view is not so clear anymore. And this is one lesson for the students. You may reach the top but then you still have other things. You want to go higher, higher. At the end, you have to finish. Anyway, I'd like to start with this. And then I, I start out by exactly posing what we posed 30, 35 years ago, the question, how do you come from a fertilized egg to an adult mouse? Or in other words, from how do you convert a cell A to a cell B? And although we have an enormous amount of knowledge microarrays, all kinds of genes going up and down. We don't understand how this works. So uh, what have we done? Uh, we've obviously rationalized the genetics will give us answers, and we've done model organisms, which at, in the age of 2012 may not be so relevant. Anyway, we've done, sorry, we have done a lot in tissue culture cells. And we, as you will see, you can regenerate a whole mouse out of a tissue culture cell. I think that's important. And this is only possible because we have established very powerful genetic tools to transfer genes from A to B, and thereby correlating the phenotypes which you obtain. So this is in 79. I give you a very quick history. I'm also an old guy starting in bacterial genetics. So I'm very familiar with phages and bacteriophages. But then I moved on to, uh, based on the work by Beatrice Mint, Leroy Stevens, and Ralph Pinster, to study really the mouse as an a important model organism. We established gene transfer into stem cells and mice. We made the microinjection to DNA. We went on to, see the, to, to establish the ES cell technology and gene transfer into these cells and go, went on to identify important growth factors and functions of genes. Now, the questions back then were the same, more or less, as what we have today. And that is, again, a this is in the old days, we had either, either foils, these plastic foils, or these slides, which always were mixed up. Uh, so the, the, the answer, the questions were, why do we want to do this? And I've given you some, some explanations. To study the basic of, basis of gene expression, to investigate what happens when you change the activity of a gene. 35 years ago, that wasn't so clear. But also, we wanted to generate mutants, genetic mutants, which we can analyze to find out the basis of, uh, of disease. And at that time, we were also trying to get grants for making animal models of human disease. And what I will do is I give you a very brief five minute back then what we did and how exciting this is, still is, at least for me. Um, and then uh, I'll give you two examples from the, the rationale in cancer biology, how we go from patient to mice and from mice to patients. And uh, they, I will end up with two examples from the lab, which we've done since we moved to, to Madrid. So the mo genetic modifications, they allowed us to transfer any, any gene, any designer mouse basically into the germline, any mutation in the germline through transgenic technologies. And which were these technologies which we established? The target was in one, in one particular set of experiments, the fertilized egg. And that is a random procedure, which you will see in a second. But then came the teratocarcinoma cells, tumor cells, or embryonic stem cells, where we can make pre-designed changes in vitro, and then we circle them back into the mouse. How is it done? Microinjection depicted here. It's a very, maybe useless technique. I would agree with Sydney today because the DNA is integrated somewhere. You have no control over the DNA where it goes. If you want to do mutational screens, they may still be valuable, but for studying sophisticated functions of gene, you will not resume to this technology. You will exclusively focus on the tissue culture system, whether this is now the ES cells, like we did it 25 years ago, or IPS cells, this is up to you. You have cells in culture which you can either induce to differentiate. You can do this also with human cells. You don't have to use mouse cells. Very similar, more expensive, so maybe not, not so good to do a lot of human ES cells in, in Madrid right now. 
Uh, but you, the unique potential is that these cells in vitro, they go back into the mouse, and they can make an entire mouse. And 35 years ago, 40 years ago, we were very baffled. How does it, why is this possible? That a cell which, when injected uh, into the mouse, makes a tumor, but when it goes back to the embryo, it takes part in, uh, in normal development. And since this is fundamental, I thought I'd show this technique. So what you do is you have a, you see a holding pipette and you see an injection pipette. And here you have a, an embryo, pre-implantation, about 60 cells, 64 cells, blastocysts. And here you have the cells. These are the ES cells or IPS cells. You pick them up in your pipette and then you, you will see it's a bit tedious. You have to get now your embryo. And now the amazing thing happens, you, try, you inject into this embryo about 10 to 15 cells. Now these cells have been selected, they have been kept, they've been frozen, they've been thawed, they've been years in your freezer. And if this embryo is a tetraploid embryo for the experts, none of the tetraploid cells will take part in the development and only the cells which are now being injected in a minute, you will see, they will form the entire organism. Now this embryo, I don't know whether you would say, if you're Catholic, you probably say there's already life here, um, this embryo clearly doesn't know and cannot differentiate between the cells injected and the surrounding cells. So stochastically, this will give rise to an entire organism. And this you will see then in a few minutes, this blastocyst in this cavity injected, they collapse and then you, you pick them up again, put them back into, the, into a pseudopregnant foster mother and here it goes, let's hope, and the mice are born. So three weeks later, you get pups born, and the geneticists among you who work with mice, they know if the cultured cells came from a particular strain of mice, which, have a, which confers the coat color in, in brown here, and the entire mouse is brown. All cells in these mice, all somatic cells, including the germ cells, come from the cultured cells. So this is sort of the approach to designer mice, as you, if you wish, yeah? And no matter what you think about in 2012, this for me is still a valid, a valid approach for, a different, for different reasons. And I will now explore, uh, tell you why I think so and why this is important in cancer research. So in the early 90s, we already r rationalized that it's possible to make these genetically modified mice and that uh, you can study the process from a mouse which is predisposed to cancer, for example, how they can develop tumors. Whether this is relevant or not, I think at that time it was very important. This is in the 90s, okay? And we rationalized that it can be used for chemo prevention, chemotherapy, but for biochemists or cell biologists or developmental biologists, you could obviously use these mice as a rich source to explain cells and do all kinds of things uh, in vitro. And often you can reprogram the cells and get them back in vivo. Now, things have changed. Ten years later, Doug, a friend of mine, and Bob Weinberg, they published that tumors are like an external organ. And if you want to target tumors, you have to target also the accessory cells and not only the tumor cells. So the concept of the microenvironment, whether this is stromal cells, whether this is immune cells or endothelial cells, became very clear that if you want to have an effective therapy, you need to target not only the tumor cells, but also the accessory cells. And another 10 years later, in 2011, an update was published on the hallmarks of cancer and also the ways how you could think of interfering with these processes, either being the sustained proliferative capacity of cancer cells or if you want to have selective anti-inflammatory drugs to, to uh, combat inflammation-associated cancers, or you take the immune system where you activate the T cells and arm them that they kill the tumor. And the recent data, are, again, for Carlos, are very exciting because I think the immune system will come back to, to kill cancer cells. Now, having said this, so what, where do we start? What are the strategies in cancer research? And by no means do we start with the mice. We clearly start with the patient from the diagnosis, different parameters, down to the molecular analysis, to the tissue culture cells, the tumor cells which you can characterize, then you can come back to the mouse models and validate what you see in vitro, and you can envisage to do novel therapies. But again, there is a feedback loop, as we know from 
bacterial genetics, you can back, go back to the mouse model, and you can go back to the patient. And so by no means do we see the mouse experiments in isolation. They are always linked to the human patient. So what models do we use? Now, it would be far-reaching to now tell you all the mouse models which can be used, but just for those of you who are interested, you can have spontaneous cancer models, you have chemically induced cancer models for skin carcinomas or liver cancers, very popular the xenografts, and then you have the genetic mouse models. Now, all this, I think, is all accessory information which you would gather to understand the functions of gene in cancer development. And um, many people have started, uh, for example, their career at the Cineo, where they model the, the human tumors by taking mutations which you have present in human tumors and you make them in a mouse, and then you can do gain of function, loss of function of oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes, and you can start preclinical trials with the mouse models and then advance them to co-clinical trials in humans. So, I will give you now at the end, if I have another 10 minutes, I guess, uh, I will give you two stories on something we have been fascinated by in the last 30 years, and this is a transcription factor complex. I've been very loyal to these proteins for so many years because we have so much knowledge, but we really don't understand what they do. And uh, this factor is called the AP1 transcription factor complex. It it's a family affair, like, uh, you know, you have different proteins there, which are very reminiscent in terms of their binding activity, recognizing the sequences in the genome where they activate or repress transcription, and they're collectively called either the FOS or JUN proteins. They are determinants whether a cell can proliferate, differentiate, or die. And we have extensive knowledge on what they do in bone development, in liver cancer, or in skin cancers, and, and so forth. And two examples I want to give you, and the examples are chosen because I was asked to give an update on modern mouse models, so we will see a very sort of new technique which we now use if you want to do a mouse model, and then I, I show you an example of convergence biology where human biology meets mouse biology. So AP1 is a stress-responsive transcription factor complex. Many experiments where we delete the genes and we don't stress the animal or the cells in vitro, nothing happens, but if you take UV light or if you, um, stress the mouse with other insults, it becomes very important. But also I have to say that if you completely delete these genes, they are mostly are lethal genes and the, the lethality tells you that these are essential genes. And they can be activated in different cells. And if you look at a tumor, you can obviously activate it in the tumor cells, then you call it an oncogene. If it's active in the accessory cell, you can say it's a gene which is important in macrophages to promote tumorigenesis, for example. And one gene, which exemplifies many transcription factors, whether you call it FOS, MYC, ETF2, or whatever, uh, the studies in the mice, they, get, they tell you very clearly if this gene is essential, in, in where is it limiting, where is it important, in cancers, or in, uh, when you make deletions in the brain, or in the bone marrow cells, or you take it out completely. And by loss of function experiments, which are more physiological than if you do gain of function experiments, you can then see that the gene, if you make too much of the gene, if the pathway is activated, as we say in, in oncology, then you get tumors, osteosarcomas. That brings me to that, that but a very important organ, which is also an endocrine organ, the bone. And the bone is composed of osteoblasts and osteoclasts, and all FOS proteins control the integrity of the bone. And this is biomedically hugely important because osteoporosis is a serious problem. These genes may counteract, there are many new drugs out there now, not necessarily activating AP1, but the upstream uh, signal cascade. Not having AP1 proteins, bone loss, too much bone tumors. Why? We don't understand it. So one model which Latifa established when we came to the Cinea was a switchable model. It's like this light. I was asking to turn down these lights. They came down, and now they're up again. I don't know why, but if we do mouse experiments, we can decide when we turn on the gene and when we turn it off. And why is this important? I will show you. You insert it, your gene in a predetermined locus, a single copy. It is silent, and then you bring in other alleles. This is genetics. It's very complicated. If anyone wants to know, I can tell you. You switch on the gene at your will. At also at any stage in development of this animal, in the adult stage, before they die, whatever, to rescue them. And then you have the gene on, like this light is on. But if I tell them to switch it off, I can switch it off. And what happens with this is the following. If you have it on for six weeks, either from the start or 
uh, in the adult mouse, you immediately see a thickening of the bone. And you can then measure all these bone parameters, which are obviously in the clinic, BMDs, everyone knows, bone mineral density, and so forth. And what is even more interesting, you can switch it off. You turn on, you make more bone, you switch it off, you reduce it. You can ask the question, where is the point of no return? Either how many mutations have you accumulated by making this one genetic change when you cannot return? And this allows you now today to really understand the genetic program which is, which is responsible for a particular phenotype in the mouse. And I've listed some of these things which you can do. So this, you would say, is pretty mouse-oriented. And this is really on the scale of what Sidney told us, maybe this mouse experiment uh, historical at this stage. But if you're curiosity driven, I think they're still important. Let me finish up with the second example, which is highly relevant to human biology and also to mouse models. And this is an inflammatory skin disease which affects two to three percent of all of us. Yeah? So two or three among hundred have this disease. It's not a life threatening disease, but it's a bad disease. There's no cure. And the big question is can we solve the mystery of psoriasis? Is it the immune cells which cause that highly inflamed tissue? What is responsible for these very precise, very demarcated lesions here where you have highly inflamed itchy skin? Or is it something in the keratinocytes from our environment which we are exposed to, whether that is the pollution, the hygiene, whatever, which start, kicks off the, the, uh, the disease environmental factors and then they uh, alert the immune system to combat the disease and then they overshoot and then you get this. So this, without a mouse model and without comparing human patient material and mouse material, we would not identify new targets. And this is what we have done. We have established an inducible psoriasis like mouse model. We published this fairly highly, the mechanism. This was then mainly gene-driven approach because we inducibly deleted mouse uh, in, in these two genes in the mouse, and you can see human skin and mouse skin. Reminiscent, but not the same. So let me tell you quickly what we have done. The approach is where we took isolated genes as candidates of the transcription factors, done with genomic approaches. So microarrays, we identified the top-up and top-down regulated gene without the human. So this is the phenotype of the animals, obviously. They're very reminiscent of the scaly black. They have arthritis all the stuff which you also have in psoriatic arthritis, and this can be induced in two weeks, the whole program. So the approach is identified that if you manipulate these genes at the outside, in the keratinocytes, that is sufficient to trigger the disease. And they identified factors like metalloprotease inhibitors, like TIMP3, like chemoattractant proteins, calcium sensing proteins, like S100 and VGF, and we made all genetic tools to identify and validate whether these are important targets. But that will not get us to new targets. So how can you get new targets from a mouse model? But you start, like I said, with patient material. So the open questions were then, uh, are these relevant in human psoriasis? Do microRNAs control these genes? Can we cure with the microRNA these ongoing experiments? Why can blocking S100 prevent a disease in the mouse? Well, but how do we identify new targets for therapy? So how would you go about? And you think about that you don't want to touch the mouse. So you go and take the patient material. So we have answered these questions, but you do proteomic analysis of human patient material and compare the proteome, identify 1,000 proteins in the mouse psoriatic skin. And then you see what is common, what is top and what is down. And what you find, that there are certain genes which are grouped in different characters, as you can see. But the most Im important take home message from this is that many genes, all basic mechanisms between the mouse and the human skin have been conserved. So the gene which came out on top, and I'll finish in a minute, was a factor which is part of the complement cascade. And complement is an ancient, evolutionary, very old defense mechanism to, to fight pathogens. So C3 is one of these components. And now you can do in, in the mouse model, you can validate whether C3 is really important. And this is what we have done. And if you block C3, you prevent the, the disease. So that's a new target. And basically, the finding from this data is that we have established a functional link between the perturbance in the outside of the skin 
to very important signaling molecules which signal then to the immune system and that gets amplified and leads to these lesions. Why there are lesions are only in certain areas, I can tell you later, but this C3 also is highly expressed in, in psoriasis and is located in a susceptibility genetic locus. So I'll finish now uh, by telling you what can we deduce from these experiments 30 years later. No matter what you hear from elderly statesmen, mouse models are useful. There is no doubt to me. And no matter what they cost, we can reduce the costs and we can do less. But they are very essential for some fundamental questions in biology. For example, to understand disease mechanism, including cancer. Clearly, today, we have to have a, a holistic approach. We must look for the whole and not for the parts. And we have a lot of knowledge about crosstalk in organs and so, but that would be a different talk. To model human disease, we need better model, models, uh, mouse models, I told you. To understand human disease or cancer, we, look, we need to look at the patient. I agree with, with Sydney on this. We have to get much better access and much better communication with the physicians. And that is very difficult because that's a different culture with a different language, as Sydney was pointing out. And we don't understand the language of the physicians. And they don't understand us. So do we need more clinics for a mouse or better co-clinical trials? Maybe yes, I don't know. Do we need personalized medicine? I can answer this in questions. Uh, I have my doubts um, because of all the mutations which gone within one tumor in, in, one, anim, in one human. Uh, we probably need to combine all our efforts, which we have seen at the hallmarks of cancer, to uh, efficiently uh, kill cancer. And, um, I think it's not a, uh, not a statement of a wise man, but there will be no magic bullet, I think, which will kill every cancer. So I think it needs a concerted effort, uh, and there's still lots to do, like in my first slide. You go up to the top, and you will find there's many more open things you need to tackle. So I hope I've given you a little overview. I tried to make a statement that uh, I made my career on mouse models, so I cannot say that they're useless, yeah? Uh, but I hope you, I convey to the physicists, or whoever is here, that this is very, uh, still an exciting area, and there's lots to learn, uh, to understand. Thank you very much.